Thanks for being here. Um, what was mentioned also is um, Leonard uh, is co-author uh, with Stephen Hawking on many books, including Grand Design, A Briefer History of Time, and of course, um, his very well-known books on how randomness uh, rules our lives, subliminal, uh, the upright thinkers, on and on. But today we are going to talk about elastic thinking and then a little bit later we're going to talk about the healing self. So Leonard, I really enjoyed reading your book and uh, I'm still <coughs> not done. But, uh, but you read far enough to have questions for me. <laughs> yeah, we have some questions. Let's get right to the questions right away. Because, you know, in the, even though time doesn't exist, we have <laughs> a, a perception of it anyway, or an experience of it. Uh, let's start with the questions and then we can go back and forth a little bit. But uh, would you tell us what you mean by elastic thinking? Well, I talk about three ways that biological systems process information. The simplest, most primitive way is uh, scripted thinking, or sometimes psychologists call them fixed action patterns, but it's not just humans that do it. All animals do it, even in a sense bacteria do it. And those are very reflexive ways of processing information. The, the data comes in, whether it's a bacteria sensing chemicals or an insect sensing chemicals or light, and it gets processed in an automatic way, in the same way every time, and, a, and an answer comes out. Uh, one example of it, for instance, is uh, a mother goose sitting on the nest. If one of her eggs falls out, she'll reach her neck over and she'll bring it back in. This, this looks as if it's the loving action of a, of a loving mother, but scientists have noticed that if they put a crumpled beer can next to the nest, she'll do the same thing, or even a volleyball or she'll try to do it. So it really isn't any kind of thinking at all. It's a reflexive action. And especially primitive animals uh, live that way most of their lives. Uh, evolution has provided that because they live in a non-changing routine environment. The mother goose doesn't often have a beer can next to her nest or a volleyball. So the fact that she does this unthinkingly doesn't, doesn't hurt the species. They, they survive just fine. But for situations where there's change in the environment, other kinds of thinking are needed. And human beings have a more sophisticated kind of thinking, which is still not tailored toward change, but it's better than those fixed action patterns. And that's logical or rational thought, analytical thinking, where you have the rules of logic to get from A to B to C and so on. And that's gotten us far. We, so far that, I mean, the society values it very much. We test it on the SATs, uh, schools ask for it, employers try to find it in people. And it's, it's a very powerful way of thinking. Is that a result of education? Well, it's, it's built into our brain. The ability is built into our brain, but uh, we get practice with it and we become better through education. We also become worse at it in ways mm -hmm. through education. Yes. That's a whole other discussion, Deepak. Yes. <laughs> um, but it's, 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 a, it's another standard way that we think, but it's, it's also best applied to situations where the methodologies are set, where the, the framework of our thinking, the, the, the questions that we're asking are fixed, the framework is fixed, and then we apply that to get from that framework and those propositions from A to B. But when things change, when we're, we have new challenges we haven't seen before, or the situations come up that are similar to the way we've seen, but they have a twist on them, those kinds of thinking tend to fail, just like the mother goose with the beer can. And for that, we humans especially, more, much more than any other animal, have this elastic thinking, which is a, it's a thinking where you're not following the rules, you're making up the rules, or you're breaking the rules, or even the, the act of deciding that the rules need to be broken or that the old rules don't apply anymore. It's how we adapt to change and how we get new ideas and come up with uh, innovations. And that's, that's why I wrote the book, because Society today is changing faster than ever before. The change in society tends to be exponential, but an exponential change doesn't change quickly at the beginning. It just means that things double at a fixed time. So if you have one cent and it might double every year, that's an exponential rise, but you're only gaining a cent the first year and you're getting two cents the next year. Once you get to another part of the curve 
where you have a million dollars, then, you're, then now you're getting somewhere when it doubles in a year. And that's what's happened to society today. The change has gotten to the point where as it continues to double at a fixed interval, we're having trouble coping with it. And elastic thinking is the remedy. Okay, that's great. And I want to go through all the questions I had. But um, based on what you said right now, um, what does elastic thinking have to do with creativity, if anything? Well, elastic thinking is in some ways a larger uh, realm than creativity. There are certain realms, aspects of, create, of elastic thinking that are important in creativity, such as imagination, idea generation, the generation of ideas. Um, and then there are certain aspects of, of, of elastic thinking that are important in problem solving, but not strictly speaking creativity. For instance, being mindful of how you're thinking and figuring out how to, how to identify the assumptions, the hidden assumptions that you're making, and how to determine whether they're the proper assumptions or not. But you do need elastic thinking for creativity? Yes, and also, but I have to say that, uh, make it very clear that creativity needs some aspects of elastic thinking, but creativity also needs this logical, analytical thinking. Because ideas without guidance are just like babbling. Which, and in order to create something that's useful and to have a creative product, you need to have the logical, analytical part of your brain guide the elastic part of your brain together to form something creative. Okay. I might want to come back to that afterwards. But so if you're in charge, questions. that'll be easy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so uh, what you talk a lot about in this book about bottoms up uh, thinking and top down thinking. I don't think any, anybody in the audience Know the difference? Well, so top-down thinking is the kind of thinking where you have the thinking is guided by a CEO or an, they call it in your brain an executive function or a designer, someone figuring out what to do or a programmer and having that, uh, that plan executed. It's the way that computers used to operate. Well, most computers still operate. It's the traditional way computers operate where a programmer forms an algorithm that the computer is going to execute to get the answer. Bottom-up thinking is completely different. Bottom-up thinking is what, for instance, ants do, ant colonies. Uh, scientists who study ants tend to consider the colony as more of an organism than the individual ant. The ants themselves have very simple uh, rules that they go by, which determine what they do, where they go forward, backward, turn left, turn right, if, if, if something, if they encounter this chemical, they do this, and et cetera. There are those fixed action patterns, scripted things, and they're very simple scripts that they follow. And yet, when you have a colony of thousands and thousands of ants, that colony can, cre can create a sum of those parts that's much greater than the parts themselves, a whole that's greater than the sum. In, in mathematics, we call it um, an emergent property. For instance, when an ant colony comes to a gap that they have to cross as they're as they're marching somewhere, they might get together and form a chain and, 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 and make a bridge over that gap, and the other ants will climb over them over the bridge. There's no designer, there's no architect, there's no CEO, there's no boss. Somehow they just do it. And they've, they've developed that method through millions of years of evolution, which has adjusted the rules in a way that the, that the, that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. But our brains work in exactly the same way. Our neurons are like the ants. Our neurons follow very simple rules, and, and they're connected to each other, much more connected than the ants. Each neuron is connected to about 10, 1 to 10,000 other neurons. And somehow, through the very simple rules that they follow, by getting signals from other neurons and giving off signals, the sum, or the whole, which is our thinking, is much greater than the sum of the parts of the neurons. So when the human brain is capable of this amazing bottom-up thinking, like, like, in, like ants on steroids, right? But the brain is also hierarchical. So the brain doesn't just have all these neurons working. It has organizational structure, where the neurons uh, are formed into structures, and those structures are united into bigger structures, and they're united into bigger structures on many multiple levels. And when you get to the high levels, those higher level structures, they do the executive uh, function. So our brains can work both ways. We have high level structures that act as an executive that tell our minds what to do, what to focus on, what to pay attention to how to think, competing with, at the same time, the bubbling cauldron of our little neurons trying to give us random ideas that they're coming up with, like the ants. 
And so as these two interact with each other, we have different kinds of thinking. And the, what's important in, in, in maximizing your elastic thinking is learning how to take control of that. Give me an example of bottoms up thinking in a human being. Well, whenever, you, okay, if you have a problem or an issue in life and you sit down and think very hard about it and you want to solve that problem, overcome the issue or, or the challenge, you, you'll probably, you, you most likely start with logical analytical thinking. You try to reason it out, okay? And quite often you'll come into a barrier and you'll get nowhere, you just, you don't know the answer to the problem. Or if you're in a creative field, for instance, when I'm writing the book, I'll, I don't know how to write that chapter. Or when I, I wrote that, um, The Remembrance of Stephen Hawking, I, ha you know, I, I uh, had no idea what I wanted to write. A and the logical, analytical side of me wasn't going to really give me the answer. But after you set up the problem in your head, then you learn to relax, to, to defocus your brain to let those, that cauldron of ideas bubble up from your unconscious mind where it starts up to your conscious mind and ideas suddenly come to you. I'm sure all of you have had that where you have a problem and you think about it and suddenly the answer comes to you. Or you told me yourself, Deepak, that when you write the books, you think about it, go to bed in the morning, the chapter's written, right? Well, <laughs> so that, 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 that's what's happening. Yeah. You know, uh, early in my career, I was very close to Candice Bird to actually gave the uh, phrase molecules of emotion. And I know we're going a little bit off the script here that I had planned, but um, she once said to me, um, our body is our subconscious mind. And at that time, you know, uh, we were still looking at things like serotonin and oxytocin, dopamine, opiates, etc. But now that we know that our microbiome is 99% of the genetic information in our body is in the microbiome, but even more important, the microbiome genes are responsible for more than 90% of the serotonin that's produced in our body, not the brain. And the gut is in fact a nervous system, not only because of the microbiome, but also the neural networks there, and. There are now neural networks that we're looking at the heart. So people say, I have a gut feeling about such and such, or you know, the heart has reasons that reason doesn't know. I was thinking that bottoms up thinking could include this whole gestalt of you know, Very, whole body thinking in a way. It definitely does. And, mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the bottom up, the elastic thinking also has a lot of input from your emotions, mm -hmm. which are thought to be detrimental to your logical, rational thinking, and certainly there's no room in the rules of logic for emotion, but there is in elastic thinking and your, and your bottom-up thinking. And it's, your, your emotions are extremely closely tied to the state of your body. Mm -hmm. So um, everyone's heard this phrase, uh, we use only 10% of our brain. Now, uh, you know, I've been working with Rudy, and that seems a myth. We use 100% of our brain, but um, you have a good take on this, that we use 100% of our brain, but probably a very little of the potential that's there, inherent in our thinking, right? True, so it's, it's definitely a myth that there are parts of our brain that are unused. It's all being used, but it may not all be being used to our optimal use. And what happens in your brain is that our, our brains are really idea machines. They're, they're constantly given any topic, any challenge, any problem in your life. Your, brains are, your brain is generating tons of ideas. And these are coming on the unconscious level. If they all surfaced into your consciousness, you'd, you'd be non-functional because you'd drown in all these ideas that are coming. Some of the ideas are pretty good, some of them are pretty silly, uh, weird, uh, and uh, your brain filters out, tries to filter out those. It has these, what the psychologists call cognitive filters, which kill the ideas that don't seem very promising. <laughs> well, that's a good thing, though. That's why uh, if you think about uh, going to Europe, you don't consider swimming there. Or, or jumping there, you, you know that you take a plane, you're not gonna drive there, but your, your mind is generating ideas like that. Or uh, 
your behavior also depends on that. You get ideas, you get impulses, impulses for behavior that, that get censored at an unconscious level uh, by, by these filters. So that's good because it keeps inappropriate ideas and behavior away and, 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 it, and, it, and it suppresses uh, silly or useless ideas. But it can also suppress ideas that may at first, at first seem silly or useless but are really good, they're original, they're new, they're different. They're things that people don't normally think of because these filters are working. And so that's what I mean when I say you're not really using all of your brain unless you learn to relax those filters and, and, and harvest all those great ideas that, you know, from that, from that sea of questionable ideas and find the gems there, mine them, and, and bring them into your consciousness. Would you say uh, filters are the same thing as editing mechanisms? Well, you could look at it that way. Uh, what you have are a large number of ideas. If, 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 that were, if they were all written in a book, the filter would be the editor who comes and takes out the dumb ones, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, or you could look at it as a, as a sieve that keeps back certain I ideas. See, uh, one, since we, Buddhism was brought up here, um, and we're in a place which champions Eastern thought. Um, most of our filters, according to the traditions of the East, are a result of the conditioned mind, which starts getting conditioned very early in childhood, you know, uh, whether it's through education or religion or economics or just culture. So most of the ideas that we have I think all our thoughts are actually not original at all. They're recycled, collective, conditioned mind based on these days, especially what's happening in the media, you read in the news, now everybody's talking, this is fake news, this is real news, it doesn't matter. But do we really, 99% of humanity, have any elastic thinking at all, or are we just kind of becoming bundles of conditioned reflexes and nerves that are constantly being triggered by people and circumstance into very predictable outcomes based on you know the rigidity of collective thinking? I don't believe that that is the sole manner in which humans operate, and that they can certainly rise above that and do every day in, in your own life. Uh, but that is also a way that people act much more often than they realize, just like with the mother goose. There have been experiments on humans that show in complex social interactions we can fi follow these mindless reactive scripts. There's an Ellen Langer, who I know you like, as a psychologist, was at Yale and Harvard, did an experiment a while back where uh, she stationed a graduate student near a copying machine. And when people came up to the copying machine, the graduate student would try and get his stuff in before, before they did. And they had three different questions they would ask, and she uh, measured the, uh, the success rate of each, of each way of asking. One was, um, I have five copies to make. Can I get in front of you, please? That was, that was uh, successful about 50% of the time, which surprised me. <laughs> but um, <laughs> Maybe they were more uh, kinder times. Um, the second way was, uh, I have five, started this, and I have five copies to make. Can I get in front of you, please? because I'm in a hurry. That was successful 94% of the time. That's a good bump, okay? Now, sounds like these people are standing there at the copying machine, they listening to this person ask the information, uh, give them information, they're making a decision, deciding, well, oh, they're in a hurry, I'm not, go ahead and get in front of me. But she was wondering, maybe that's not true, maybe they're like the mother goose and they're, they're just conditioned to, they'll, they may automatically say no, or half the time they'll say no when there's no reason given. But if there's a reason given, they will, they will let the person in. It doesn't matter what the reason is. Maybe they're not even listening, just like the mother goose isn't really scrutinizing whether this is an egg. So, so the third way the graduate student would try to get in was to say, again, it started off the same way. I have five pages to make. Can I get in front of you, please? And then he would say, because I have pages to copy. <laughs> doesn't add much, right? It's kind of a joke. But... 93% success rate with that. So if you want to convince somebody of something, just give a reason. Even if you don't have a good reason, just give a reason. 
But this is obviously a scripted thinking that, that you're talking about, but I, we, we can rise above that. I don't think when Einstein invented general relativity that he was reacting to you know, uh, this morass of uh, ordinary conventional... Yeah, well, well, Einstein and people like him, or artists, um, frequently break the rule, right? They're disruptive. But we all do in our lives. If you're thinking of making a vacation, going on vacation, and you thinking of going to some new different place or getting there in a different way or trying uh, a new website. That's all, that's all elastic yes. thinking because you're not just following uh, 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 your old ways. You're just not, you're not just using reasoning. You're saying, do I really want to go there? Why am I, why am I going to Hawaii? Uh, is it out of habit? Do I, what's, what, what am I really after on this vacation? Or whatever you're asking uh, you know, can benefit from it, even in, in your larger life. A lot of people go through life uh, being somewhat satisfied with their lives, let's say, or dissatisfied, somewhat satisfied, not totally satisfied, right? But they don't question why they're doing what they do or what the alternatives are, and they just keep going in their life that way. Um, and I, I'm someone who can speak to that because I've had so many different careers of, uh, you know, physicists uh, and uh, uh, writing for TV, computer games, writing books, uh, worked as an executive for a few years, Star Trek. Star Trek. Yeah, and, and I, so I'm always going, I'm, I'm the opposite, which maybe I have too much of that, where I'm always going, are you sure? Don't you want to try something new? But um, th th that's, those are ways that elastic thinking enters into everyone's lives. The, the example that you just heard uh, from Ellen Langer is in the book. And it turns out that as I was writing my book, I was also quoting. <laughs> you have a great. You should just tell such a. You want. You should tell the uh, credit card story. Well, no, even more interesting than the credit card story is that. <laughs> wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait. A minute. Okay. If he says this, let me tell you the credit card story. Uh, okay. She goes to pay uh, with her credit card. The clerk says you didn't sign it. She signs it. Okay. Then the clerk gives her the bill. She signs the bill. Then the clerk takes the credit card and the bill and compares it to make sure it's the same person signed them. So this is a script that she normally does for all bills and credit cards, but when you actually see the person sign, you don't have to do that, right? Yes. Okay, let's see why your story goes. No, my story, <laughs> because I'm interested in the biology of aging, she did an experiment in the 80s where she had uh, older people in their 80s go to a nursing home, uh, or a resort, actually, but, uh, <laughs> um, and then she had to control group somewhere else. But, these people uh, were instructed to pretend that they were in their 50s. Uh, so they wore the same fashions, uh, clothing, they watched uh, movies like Anatomy of a Murder, Alfred Hitchcock, le uh, uh, heard music from that era, Elvis Presley, etc. And then she looked at the biological markers of aging, at that time not so sophisticated, but still, things like flexibility, skin thickness, and blood pressure, and many other things. And in one week, the biological markers of aging had significantly changed, just because they were in the mood psychologically, emotionally, and actually behaving in a different era. The and biology that's shifted. And that's a very, it's a very important point. Your, in your, your mindset is extremely important. Uh, it's amazing how influential your mindset is, and that's one of the points of the book, is that you can work to change your mindset to think in different ways. But uh, one of the experiments that I really like on that, uh, they gave people these problems, the word problems, where they give you three words, um, like crab, pine, and sauce. I got to make sure to say those three words and not the fourth word, which is the solution. <laughs> Crab, pine, and sauce. And they say, find another word that goes with each of them. Uh, for instance, uh, crab, pine, and sauce. Um, you could say cone, pine cone. But there's no cone sauce or sauce cone, so that doesn't work. But you want to find a word that works with all three of them. And there's two approaches. What, one is to use your rational thought to just start finding words that go with one of them and then checking whether they go with the second one, with the third one, and if not, throw it out and keep going. That's how a traditional computer would do it. Um, that was a computer that was programmed in a traditional way. The other way is to do what we talked about earlier, where you, you think about the problem and then, and then you let it percolate and you, you 
do something else and you, you rest and then suddenly, bam, it comes to you as a sudden insight. So I don't know how many of you got this problem. This problem, I forget the statistics, I think half or a third of the people get it within a minute or two or something like that. Um, the answer in this case is, um, is apple, applesauce, pineapple, and um, what did I say? Crab apple, crab apple, applesauce. So, but this is the, the interesting thing about this experiment was people solve it uh, in an fMRI where being, the brains are being imaged and they can the, the scientists can watch what parts of the brain are working and they can watch how the different parts of the brain are either executing logical thinking or this uh, elastic thinking that leads to the sudden insight. And after the people answered the question, they asked them, which way did you solve it? And people would say, I reasoned it out or it just suddenly came to me. Um, but the scientists actually could predict from the fMRI machine before the person even knew how they solved it, how they were going to solve it. And they know this because they could tell before they even gave them the question how they were going to solve it. They could tell, are they going to use insight or are they going to use elastic uh, thinking or are they going to use logic to solve this problem? By looking at the, at the fMRI, they could see what parts of the brain were working. It was their mindset. They would go into it with a mindset of one way or the other. So it was fascinating. Your, your mindset determines how you approach a problem. So uh, how many people here have heard of uh, cognitive behavioral therapy you have? Huh? Uh, how many people are familiar with uh, the work of Byron Katie or Katie Byron? A few. So, you know, I'm thinking that elastic thinking has a lot to do with breaking rigid patterns, too, of thinking and also belief systems because people have a lot of uh, limiting beliefs. I never can lose weight. I'll never be successful. I'm not good enough, etc. And the principles of cognitive therapy say you question those. So whatever the the belief is that's holding you back. Uh, I can't lose weight and my husband doesn't like me or I'll never be president of whatever. Uh, you actually write down that thought and then you ask yourself if it's true and you have a yes or no response to it. And then you ask yourself again, am I 100% sure if that's true or not? And now again, yes or no. By now, you're not so sure. You know, and you've held on to this rigid pattern of thinking all these years, and now you're questioning it. And then you ask yourself, um, what does holding on to this thought do to me? And then you write the answer. And then what, who would I be without this thought? Um, and then you write the opposite of that. And the more you reflect on your rigid patterns of, of thinking, they start to kind of loosen their hold on you. Right, and then that's, that's one important aspect of elastic thinking is to learn how to do that, not just in your own personal life, but in any issue or challenge any that you face. Any issue or challenge you face. It's, um, it's often, it's not, you don't even realize that, that there are assumptions there. That's, mm -hmm. that's what's so hard about it. You might not know that you're making uh, the, those assumptions. And some of these assumptions go back maybe to things you heard in your childhood, right? Right, that, that you heard that your family has and told you or implied or their social. Um, well, actually, one good example of a hidden assumptions are riddles, usually riddles. Riddles are difficult because you're making a hidden assumption that you're not aware of. To solve a riddle, once you get the assumption right, you realize you're making an assumption, the, the riddle is not rocket science, it's very simple. Like, here, here's one that I have in the book. Uh, um, Marge and Mary, were, had the same mother and father and were born at the same time, yet they are not twins. How is that possible? So don't say anything, but think about it for just a second. So they had the same parents, born at the same time, but they're not twins. Okay. Like most riddles, that's, people find that hard to understand and, and, and you, hard to solve, and you can't solve it using analytical reasoning. You have to solve it by changing the way you're picturing the situation. So anyone can blurt out the answer. Yeah, they're triplets or quadruplets. So when you hear Marge, um, Marjorie and Mary uh, are, are siblings that were, had the same blah, 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 you picture Marjorie and Mary. You picture a pair. Picturing a pair is detrimental to envisioning a trio, right? So it, once you realize that you made that assumption, the answer is not hard because it's just pretty trivial. And, and that's, that happens in all aspects of life.
Very interesting. What is neophilia? So neophilia is, means the love of the new. <laughs> what does it have to do with it? I'm gonna, no, I, that wasn't the end. I was just pausing for dramatic effect, but I gotta, <laughs> but it's always good to pause and get a laugh too. So um, <clears throat> when I first started running Elastic, I was, I was, I was reading some of these business uh, 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 journals and they kept talking about how people resist change, okay? Uh, how do we get over the natural resistance of change, the people's natural human aversion to change, et cetera, et cetera. Meanwhile, I'm, you know, I know in the psychology literature, we have this neophilia that people like new stuff and they get bored if it doesn't change and uh, no one wants a very routine uh, job where you're doing the same thing all the time. So how do you reconcile these two? And as I read further, I found that, okay, let's look at the business articles. What change are they talking about? They're talking about the change, oh, uh, we're having a reorganization. Um, you have to learn to do 25% more work for the same money, or we're gonna reorganize and cut 10%, it might be you, I don't know. You know, those are the kinds of change that people resist, okay? But you know, if, if someone called you, in the, your boss called you in the office and said, hey, we had a reorganization, the company is uh, too efficient, we're trying to get less efficient, so you need to do 25% less work for the same money. You'd love that change, right? So it's the same change that, that you're resisting when it's the other way. So it, what people don't like are negative consequences, risk, insecurity, but they don't resist change. And as it turns out, we even have a, a gene that's related to our exploratory uh, uh, impulse and our, our neophilia. Uh, it's called DRD4. It has to do with uh, dopamine in, in the reward centers of your brain. And Scientists have found that about 100,000 years ago, there was a kind of a catastrophic climate change, sounds familiar, um, uh, in Africa, when modern humans were living in Africa, and we dwindled down to maybe thousands, hundreds, some people say dozens of, of individuals. And the groups that survived had this gene, seemed to have had this extra gene, or this, not this extra gene, but a, a form of this gene that made them more neophilic, neophilic and um, more exploratory. And they were able to, to wander further to find more resources in order to survive. And while the other humans died out, this was like a, a bottleneck that, that changed the way people think. And after that, people started spreading more and more around the world. And so we, it, it's all within us, even though there are individual differences in humans. Some people, I'll go to a restaurant and There'll be a dish there that I love, that I really am dying to have, and though the other dishes will look pretty crummy, I don't want to eat them, and I'm going to order one of them anyway, because I can't stand ordering the same thing. I've got to try something new, even if I know it's going to be probably lousy. <laughs> I'm not saying it's always a good thing, the neophilia. It's not. I talk about a guy in there who uh, had such neophilia that he went to live with grizzly bears and ended up getting eaten. So <laughs> for individuals, it's not good, but it's great for society to have this whole spectrum of people because the people who are exploring are discovering things that everybody could find useful. So, um, and I have a test in, in the, uh, a, what we call an inventory in psychology in the book where you can assess your own neophilia, but you can also work, if you want to, to increase it or decrease it and take control. So, in contrast to elastic thinking is frozen thinking. Frozen, and that's a term that was uh, coined by Hannah Arendt, the political mm -hmm. philosopher. Uh, and she was writing about the Nazi period and how people sometimes have beliefs, again, as we've been talking about, that are so uh, much a part of them that they don't even question where they come from. And they can't see any other way of thinking. And you know, the, I think the parallels to what's going on in politics and society today are, are obvious. So, People who believe one side or the other can't help but thinking the other side is, is fill in the blank. It's not a good blank. <laughs> so th that, that happens not just in politics, but it happens in science, it happens in art, it happens in, 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 in a lot of different fields. But it's, again, something that you have to fight. And I talk in the book about the, the value of uh, diversity and the value of conflict, the value of um, talking to people who think differently or the opposite of you. Um, you know, you may not find it pleasant to talk to people who completely disagree with you, but it's good for you, so you should, you should do it. And you should, 
do it sincerely and try to, try to understand where they're coming from. Try to understand why someone that you would, might respect or love uh, could feel something diametrically opposed to what you're thinking and try and open your mind to that. It's also good to focus on times where you were just wrong, where you were proven wrong. We try to forget the times we were wrong, but it's better to think about the times you're wrong because it broadens your thinking and makes you realize that what you're thinking might not be the truth and you should consider other points of view and other ideas. Coming back to a Buddhist, uh, Buddhist principle, um, one of the um, eight uh, noble paths to enlightenment is correct perspective. And Buddha says correct perspective is either no perspective or all perspectives. Um, so, you know, you talked about emergence a little while ago, and a lot is being said about emergence, especially in creative problem solving. And Dan Siegel, who you've met, a neuropsychiatrist from uh, UCLA, yes, he says if you take any problem and you get a lot of people together to look at that problem, but they're from disparate disciplines, so it doesn't matter what the problem is. You know, I could be trying to treat a patient with an intractable disease. And one of the problems is that if you have a specialist for that particular disease, the specialist will have very little elastic thinking because he knows a lot about that disease. And he can't or she can't get out of the pigeonhole of looking at the disease any other way. But if you get people who are generalists, along with the specialists, but then you get people from other disciplines, the humanities, from music, from art, from architecture, from mathematics. You put maximum diversity of disparate disciplines, you have them look at the problem, you have them give whatever opinion you have, you um, keep the whole process transparent without <coughs> criticism, and uh, you have an open system, and then you incubate. Um, for us, the incubation is usually meditation, but you could go walk in the park, or you could you know, hike in the mountains, or you could listen to music, and you just let it stay there in that collective incubation, and then somehow emergence happens. Some, some ideas trickle through that nobody had thought of before. And then, you know, they start saying, ah, that's this. So I think we're also moving in an era where people, especially doing research, for example, like now we're doing a lot of research on uh, mindfulness and mindful awareness and how that affects gene expression or telomerase or gut microbiome, etc. It's so complex that unless you get a lot of people from different disciplines to look at that whole thing, it's very easy to get caught up in rigid patterns of thinking. But collective emergence is something we should be looking at now, even for elastic thinking. Yeah, I mean, as a theoretical physicist, I know that I work much better in, with other people. And most uh, papers that you see in theoretical physics are done by groups of people, two, three, <clears throat> four people, because everybody brings a different point of view, and all the points of view have to mix to give you an answer that is more than, greater than the sum, more than each individual could come up with working on, on their own. And, <clears throat> excuse me, in the book, uh, I thought it was vodka. <laughs> in, in, the, in the book, I'm I, making I, my own cognac right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Give me some. Um, I talk about a firm called Intellectual Ventures where they, th th their principle is to work in a bottom-up fashion. They have all these different um, people from different um, specialties mingling with each other and they come up with really inventive things, one of which is uh, I want to mention. It's a uh, kind of a Star Wars system to shoot mosquitoes out of the air. And uh, it sounds like uh, using a hammer to kill a bug or using a bazooka, but it's actually an extremely um, uh, um, important invention because it's for use in Africa where malaria is a big problem. And they've invented a, a system that uses approximately the energy of a light bulb 
and can detect at a distance and shoot down about 30 mosquitoes a second. And uh, it's just, I won't go into the, all the ideas behind it, but it had to do with people from laser physics, from com computers, uh, uh, insect specialists, uh, a whole group of people that came up with this like crazy idea and they're uh, preparing to market it right now. So if they hadn't brought those people together, they, we would just get ray, cans of Raid, I guess, you know. <laughs> So I had a lot of questions here, but I'm not gonna, we're not going to have time to look at all these questions, but they are from the book, and I'd encourage you to um, look at the book. But there's one question that I do want to ask you about, because I'd never heard of this term before. And then perhaps we can move on to some of the ideas in the my book that may or may not, <laughs> may or may oh, yeah. not. May well, or first, may not, will you pass the cognac? <laughs> uh, may or may not uh, agree with what you've said. You know, we've been rivals in the past in many issues. We still are. But we are great friends, and we've had a great time and learned a lot from each other. In fact, I taught Leonard how to meditate. And um, uh, the question is, uh, Schizo, schizotypy. What the heck is schizotypy? <laughs> so, some years ago, uh, scientists noticed that the children of people with schizophrenia tended to have more original ideas. And they started studying, uh, studying them behaviorally and genetically, and they found that there is a trait that at one far end leads towards schizophrenia, but can, be, can fall short of that. And the, the trait has to do with the propensity to have different, unusual, strange ideas. And this, of course, is related to those filters in your, in your brain, again, uh, at the, to the level at which the filters are set. If they're set too far, you can become de detached from reality, and that's not good, usually. Sometimes we do that on purpose, but... Um, and, and if it's set too, uh, too far on the other side, then you, everything you, you think of is conventional and, and you never have any new ideas. So I have, a, I have a, another inventory there where you can um, test yourself on that, but the, the, really the best example of that is John Nash, who you might know was the subject of the book, The Beautiful Mind, A, a Beautiful Mind, who was a, a Nobel Prize winning mathematician slash economist. And he, he was on the borderline and spent many years um, in schizophrenia, in a schizophrenic state, and he thought that uh, he was being talked to by aliens, and there were vast conspiracies and all kinds of weird stuff. And and yet his his ideas that he did when he was not in that state, but when he was on the other side, got him a Nobel Prize. And after he got out of his schizophrenic state, uh, which he was in his later years, he was uh, healthier. A friend of him asked him. How could a person so brilliant as you to have these amazingly original ideas in mathematics also have thought that aliens were talking to you about vast conspiracies? And he said, because those ideas came from the same place in my brain and seemed just as real. As real. So that's schizotypy. That's fascinating. I've always personally thought I only want to hang out with sages, psychotics, and geniuses. <laughs> It's the only way to break out of these rigid patterns of thinking. So uh, you'll find a lot of very amazing insights in Leonard's book. And um, I encourage you to read it, uh, Flexible Thinking at a Time of Change right now. The world is in crisis, right? Uh, I think we can't deny that with all that's happening with rigid thinking, racism, bigotry, hatred, prejudice, extinction of species, climate change, war, terrorism, uh, mechanized death, risking our own extinction. We need elastic thinking. Thank you, Leonard. Thank you. Do you have any questions for me? I, I, I do. You want me to ask? <laughs> Uh, I, I, uh, I marked it off. Just so. Listen, only 10 minutes because we want to get the audience to ask a few questions. Okay. Shall I? If you want. I, I would love to. 
You say the dividing line, I like this, the dividing line between what happens automatically in our, in our minds and what happens voluntarily isn't fixed. What happens automatically, automatically and what and happens voluntarily? Well, voluntarily requires a moment of pause and choice. I always, in my own thinking, I make uh, choices consciously. So I don't know if you are familiar with this word metacognition, which is not in the book, but metacognition means being aware of any experience as it's happening. So you have a silent witnessing awareness to any experience that is happening, sensory experience, this experience, being aware of it as it's happening, but also being aware of the choices you're making as you're making those choices. That goes beyond ordinary thinking to voluntary thinking, voluntary choices. I guess I should back up to and say, and ask you the same question that you asked me. Um, what is the healing self? I think we can actually do that question and then let the audience Sounds ask good. Questions. All the rest okay, of my so, work. OK, no, but I think. No, they'll, because, they'll... you know, The Healing Self uh, is the title of the book, and you asked the right question. Okay, so, <laughs> <laughs> so the word healing, etymologically, comes from the same word as whole. Whole, which is also the basis of the word heal. Wholeness, healing, health, and holy. H-O-L-Y. But when I say holy, we are not talking about self-righteous morality, but that holistic way of thinking. <clears throat> now, um, Leonard said the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Here we are in the home of Buddhism and Buddhist art. From the Buddhist perspective, Parts are actually patterns of behavior of the whole. In fact, there are no such things as parts, even though it helps us think in terms of parts. You know, I'm talking now about the healing self. So you have a liver, you have a kidney, you have a microbiome, you have the nervous system, you have the endocrine system, you have the immune system, and then you have mind, then you have emotions, then you have uh, personal relationships, social interactions. That's the wholeness of experience. Now, what we do, in especially the way we've been trained, uh, reductionism in science, but also in biology, is you look at the parts and you divide the parts into further parts. And so you look at the organs, then the tissues, then you go deeper and deeper till you get to the level of molecular biology, genome, even there, transcriptome, etc. You keep going till you get to the finest level of the part. And it works, you know, mechanistic understanding of that in acute illness works. But in chronic illness, and chronic illness is the majority of illness that we're trying to tackle right now, you know, if, if you have an acute illness, you have a pneumonia or you've got a crisis in cancer or autoimmune disease, you want to be looking at the part and handling it. But in chronic illness, what we're learning is that in 95% of chronic illness, even the gene mutations that cause chronic disease, so, you know, there are genetic mutations that are linked to disease, but only 5% of disease-related gene mutations are fully penetrant, which means they guarantee the disease. So if somebody has a Baraka gene, for example, for breast cancer, that guarantees the disease. Angelina Jolie is the big example. She had to have a preventive mastectomy because that gene would guarantee that disease. Even for that, by the way, in the next few years, there's hope because of you can soon you'll be able to cut and paste a gene. Gene editing, CRISPR, you've heard of that. But 95% of disease-related gene mutations that actually cause disease or thought to cause disease, they don't guarantee the disease. 
So for, for example, for Alzheimer's, there are 40 genes associated with Alzheimer's. Only three guarantee the disease. Cancer, there are hundreds, because cancer is not one disease, hundreds of genes associated, mutations. Less than 5% guarantee the disease. This is true of all illness. So what is the healing self is, what is the self? Self is you who makes choices every day for your well-being. And if you pay attention only to six things, good sleep, I remember when I was resident one night, I got up to go to the restroom and I heard my nurse uh, screaming at a patient, Mr. Smith, will you please wake up? I have to give you your sleeping pill. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I went up to her and I said, you're waking this poor guy up to give him a sleeping pill. She said, yeah, because I know he'll wake up in 15 minutes. Then he'll wake me up, then I'll wake you up. I said, no, please give him the sleeping pill. <laughs> <laughs> then I, you know, as I looked into the whole situation, I discovered that 90% of the prescriptions in the hospital were for five things, pain, anxiety, nausea, insomnia, and constipation. You want the big to five, huh? <laughs> the big five. The big five, and the, you know what the acronym is? PANIC, P-A-N-I-C. <laughs> That's the big five. <laughs> so in any case, good sleep, stress management in any form, but for us again, mindful awareness, mindfulness, that's the great gift that the Buddha gave to the world. 2,500 years ago, he gave the gift of mindful awareness, which was very complete, awareness of sensory experience, awareness of body, awareness of what's happening inside your body. For those of you who practice yoga, uh, it's called, these days we call it introception, but um, he called it uh, awareness of pratyahara, which is this yogic term uh, of how you can become aware of what's happening inside your body, including heart rate and you know, peristaltic movements, and in even ways to change that. So uh, mindful awareness and meditation, second. Number three, movement, exercise, but more precisely, um, the, ex the mind-body coordination that we associate with yogic practices. And so now we found out that the most important nerve in the body, autonomic nervous system, is something called the vagus nerve. And it's very interesting that the word vagus is connected to the English word vagabond. So the vagus nerve is the 10th cranial nerve, and it emerges from the midbrain, but it influences everything, it, it, the tone of your voice. If you're anxious, your voice will be different than if you're relaxed, happy, friendly. Every mood influences the tone of your voice. The vagus nerve also in, influences um, heart rate variability, which is the finest measure of whether your um, stressed or not, or whether you're on uh, sympathetic overdrive. So if, if somebody is even thinking of something that's uh, traumatic, um, their sympathetic overdrive will override their vagal tone. But the yoga asanas that we do in yoga and the breathing techniques we do, they directly stimulate the vagus nerve and influence heart rate variability. The vagus nerve goes through the diaphragm, pierces the diaphragm in the intestine influences the activity of the microbiome, which is 99% of the genetic information, and there's bidirectional traffic from the gut to the brain. So, you know, the brain and the gut are speaking to each other. In fact, bidirectional traffic now we know from all autonomic nerves back to the brain. So don't underestimate the power of yog asana, yog asana, which is normally translated as postures, yogic postures. If you look at the original Sanskrit, they are called seats of awareness. So everything you do, whether it's cat cow or sun salutation or whatever, it has, it's a seat of awareness that in, is influencing a particular autonomic nerve. Okay, so movement is third. Emotions. If you are experiencing stress, anger, hostility, guilt, depression, shame, um, any form of 
emotion that separates from you from the world. So the Buddha had the four or five what he called divine emotions, which connect you with everyone. Love, compassion, empathy, joy, equanimity. So you can look up the Sanskrit words, or you probably know them. But he said, if you cultivate emotions of love, compassion, joy, empathy, and equanimity, you will heal your physical body. Now we're looking at, actually, what happens. We paid so much attention on stress, but nobody's looked at these emotions. Well, the positive emotions. Positive emotions. How do they influence uh, what's happening? So the healing self is basically going back to what we call homeostasis or self-regulation that happens if you cultivate these simple practices. Emotions, the fourth is nutrition. And you know, I used to, in my resident days, people used to come to me and say, I changed my diet and my asthma went away. Or I changed my diet and my arthritis went away. It didn't make any sense to me because I had no way to understand that. Now we know that as soon as you put food in your body, the first thing it acts at is your microbiome, which is the genetic information of the bacteria in your gut. And so now there are artificial intelligence techniques that can look at a stool sample, and they can tell you exactly which foods are suitable for your microbiome and which foods will cause inflammation in your microbiome. These techniques are already available. So, you know, everybody says, I eat spinach, that's very healthy for me. Well, for some people it isn't, because their genes don't have the enzyme to metabolize, say, oxalate. And they don't even know that. And, you know, they're getting kidney stones, they're getting inflammation, etc. But now, you cannot change the genes your parents gave you. That's the deck of cards you got. Although you can change their activity, that's what we know from epigenetics. But still, the range of genes you have, 25,000 genes from your parents, that's what you got from your parents. But you have 2 million to 20 million bacterial genes in your body. And that population depends on what you eat. You can change your diet and find out what your microbiome is. Within a week, you'll have a completely different genetic information from your micro, microbial gene expression. So nutrition acquires a whole new understanding. If your food is manufactured, refined, processed, has too much sugar, is got uh, antibiotics, hormones, pesticides, petroleum stuff, you know, pesticides or petroleum products, or uh, any other chemicals, then the microbiome is, you know, it's after all the bacteria of the earth. And they're not used to this, but they're slowly getting used to it, <laughs> perhaps, because 30% of the microbiome has disappeared in urban societies. A lot of correlations are being made between chronic disease, inflammation, and what they call dysbiosis. Hmm. So you can correct this dysbiosis through diet. Five things I mentioned. And the sixth is something very interesting. How many people have occasionally walked barefoot on the ground, on the earth, on the beach, or on grass? You feel better, right? Well, it's very interesting. What happens when you walk barefoot on the earth, negative ions come from the earth and neutralize the excess free radicals that build up in our bodies as a result of daily stresses and inflammation goes down. So we have recently published some papers on this. We also, by the way, published a paper recently on gratitude, the feeling of gratitude. Uh, if you just write down at the end of the day what you, you were grateful for, your inflammatory markers. But that's in this book. Your inflammatory <laughs> markers come down. The gratitude exercise. OK, yeah. so gratitude will bring down inflammation in your body. And grounding or earthing will bring down inflammation in your body. And other than that, you know, our bodies respond to biological rhythms. Everyone's heard about circadian rhythms. If you have jet lag, that's a disruption in circadian rhythm. As the earth spins on its own axis, your body also has rhythms that correspond to the earth spinning on its axis. 
but we have seasonal rhythms, we have tidal rhythms, gravitational rhythms, lunar rhythms, because we are part of this symphony that we call the cosmos. This is a microcosm of that. So when you walk on the ground, theoretically, nobody has looked at that, and so we are now beginning to look at it, you should be restoring your circadian rhythms just by connecting with the earth. You know, your body is a battery, so is the earth. And you're re-synchronizing re re or resetting the battery. But if the earth and the circadian rhythms are connected to the, all the other rhythms, in a sense, you might be linking to them. So now we're looking at that too. And you, as you know, the Nobel Prize last year was for bio, in medicine biology was for biological clocks. Every cell in your body has a clock, you know, and these clocks are, some of them are independent of the other clocks, but they're still part of nature's rhythms. So in summary, that's a little bit of the healing self. Ultimately though, the healing self also involves spiritual healing, which means going beyond the fear of death, understanding your true nature as, as the Buddha said, as consciousness and transcendence, going beyond subject-object split, which is artificial. I'm the subject, you're the object, for you, you are the subject, I'm the object, but in the wholeness of experience, the whole is all there is. The parts are activities of the whole. That's what the healing self is. Very quantum, Deepak. Hmm? Very quantum. Really? Because, yeah, the, the, the multi-particle wave function there, you cannot identify the individual particles, right? That's right. So we end on a note of agreement. <laughs> Finally. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.